Thank you, Sean. Um, we really appreciate Buckley including us on this um, virtual indoor air quality education topic. Um, my name is Jeff Crane. I am a national accounts rep with GPS. I'm also a mechanical PE, um, and I joined GPS a little over a year and a half ago. And before that, I was a commercial asset and property manager in the Carolinas for a real estate company, and I managed um, a portfolio of Class A office buildings. Larry is our sales VP that covers New England and supports Buckley directly. So if you do have any questions or want to um, get any, any deeper into the weeds with us, we'd be happy to schedule a follow-up um, virtual meeting or a meeting in person um, through Buckley. So we appreciate you being here today. I'd like to start these discussions um, about indoor air quality just with some, some metrics by a company called Castle Systems. They're an access control company. They've got their equipment in 2,600 buildings in 138 cities. And since the pandemic began in March of 2020, they've been publishing weekly statistics on batch swipes at their facilities, their customers' facilities. And what they, what they show in this slide that you see here is people have kind of gotten back to normal with entertainment, with travel, with restaurants, hotels, but with their, the workplace, it's still under 50% return to office. And that means there are less than 50% of the card access swipes taking place compared to March of 2020. And they, they, they publish this data once a week. You may have seen this on CNN or in the Wall Street Journal or, or one of the newspapers that you use, but they've been cited a lot in the media because they keep track of the 10 major metros in the country. And you can see that occupancy ranges from the low 40s in the big cities up north to the high 50s, almost 60, in some of the uh, bigger cities in places like Texas. So everybody is, especially employers, office building owners, are trying to figure out what can we do to, to bring people back to the office. I think everybody is, is, has gotten comfortable with the idea of a hybrid work environment, but this has been tried in the past, and I think most employers, if they're being honest, they want people to be working together, to be collaborating. And, um, and that's, that's where, uh, before I joined GPS, my company was in the real estate and property management business. We wanted to make sure we were doing everything that we could to make our tenants feel comfortable coming back to the office. And so during the pandemic, when it first got started, um, of course, as a mechanical engineer, I looked to ASHRAE, I, I went to the CDC, to understand what, what's the latest guidance um, for building operators and managers. I was responsible for maintenance, HVAC operations, janitorial, really everything as it related to the portfolio. And ASHRAE said at the beginning of the, of the pandemic, run your, run your HVAC systems longer, purge your buildings before and after occupancy, that will allow the filters to grab more out of the air and it will allow your outside air to, to uh, dilute any potential pathogens inside the building. Second guidance they said was improve your filtration. If your buildings are capable of, of tolerating MERV 13 filters, upgrade from eight or 10, whatever you have to MERV 13. Not all buildings could do that. They're not all um, designed to run with that pressure drop. But I think in, at least with my peers and colleagues before I left the real estate industry, the, everyone seemed to be gravitating toward that MERV 13 as a standard, at least in the class A properties. Um, increase outside air ventilation. Uh, some, some people took this to mean go to 100% outside air. Of course, most buildings don't have the capacity to do that. So the guidance really should have said, bring in as much outside air as your systems can tolerate, but don't, but don't sacrifice temperature and humidity control. Uh, and then finally, they said actively clean the air. And what does that mean? And that's really, I was already familiar with all these, with the first three uh, pillars of guidance but I did a lot of research on the supplemental technologies that were out there. And a lot of you've probably done the same. So I looked at HEPA filtration. Um, you know, unfortunately, schools, hotels, office buildings, most commercial HVAC systems are just not designed to tolerate HEPA filters on a massive scale. You can buy portable HEPA air cleaners for, for hotel rooms or conference rooms or, or classroom specific applications but they tend to be loud, they're expensive, they're, they have ongoing maintenance, 
I, I ruled this out for my office buildings. <clears throat> Charcoal has a has a good um, good use for odor control and for for some other applications. It's got it's got limited uh, number of boxes that it checks. So then I I looked into UV, which I was already familiar with. Um, UV is a, a good application for keeping the face of a coil clean, but um, but it's got high first cost. It's got high um, life cycle cost because of the, the bulb replacements. And I, I ruled th this out for my properties as well, mainly because of, of cost and the number of boxes that it actually checks. And so I really focused my research on the different types of bipolar ionization out there. And I was doing a lot of parallel research with colleagues and we did a lot of comparing notes. We, we studied a lot of different OEMs. We got a lot of different um, materials from them. And there are two different families of bipolar ionization. The original one is called corona discharge, and that's an ionization that uses a sacrificial component like a glass tube and high voltage electricity to generate the bipolar ionization. Then there is the needle point family of bipolar ionization, and instead of having a sacrificial component, it uses a needle or actually, in GPS's case, uh, a bundle of carbon fiber brushes to generate positive and negative ionization. When I looked at the two different types of ionization and a lot of the different OEMs out there, I found that the original the legacy technology, uh, because it uses higher voltages, it has a tendency to generate ozone that is greater than some of the uh, needle point technologies. And so I and it also has a higher life cycle cost because of those sacrificial components that have to be replaced every so often, 18 months to two years. So the more I got into it, the more I really liked the, um, the needle point technology and specifically GPS. And one of the ways that you can distinguish between the OEMs that offer this technology is looking for an underwriter's laboratory credential that addresses the potential for ozone generation. So UL has two different certifications that OEMs can apply for and, and achieve. The lower certification is UL867, and this is the credential that California accepts, and that is a cap of 50 parts per billion of ozone generation right near the, uh, right near the generation of the ions. The more strict credential is called UL2998, and that sets a cap for devices at five parts per billion of ozone generation. And just to give you a frame of reference, the typical laser printer or copy machine tends to generate more than five parts per billion. So the entire product line at GPS carries this UL2998 credential, and, and that means they, they consider that a no ozone generation. And when you don't generate ozone, then you don't generate the byproducts that are associated with some of the, the concerns related to ozone. Not to mention, ozone is a great disinfectant, but it is also an irritant for the lungs. So CDC and ASHRAE both say, if you're gonna apply, apply an electronic air cleaner, make sure and look for that UL credential to make sure that you're not introducing ozone to your space. So with ionization, basically what we're trying to do with electricity in these devices is create positive and negative ions in the mechanical airstream that, to give us a level that more closely resembles what we see outside in nature. And we do that because we, we get benefits from these positive and negative ions. The first is that we can reduce particulate that's airborne in the air, and I'll talk about that in more detail. Secondly, there are efficacies against certain viruses and bacteria. And then third, which is one of the applications that's been around a long time, is just simple odor control. So with, with um, particulate, what we're doing with the, the carbon fiber bundles is streaming positive and negative ions into the air. And as that happens, the dust, the smoke particles, the viruses, dander, all these things are, are, have the ability to be imparted with a positive or negative charge. And as that happens, and then the air mixes in the airstream, in the ductwork, and then out in space, the positive and the negatively charged particles can join together because positive and negative charges attract. And as those, charge, as those particles join together, their mass gets larger, their particle size gets larger, and as a result of that, 
whatever filters you, you have, whether it's MER8, MER10, MER13, the filters are more capable of removing larger particle sizes. This is a chart that just shows relative particle size. You may have heard the, the uh, metric PM, PM10, PM2.5, and what that stands for is the diameter of particulate uh, of a given size. So this chart you may have seen before, but if the human hair is 50 to 180 micrometers or micrometers in diameter, you get smaller with salt, pollen, dust, and PM 2.5 is a common industry and EPA metric to talk about airborne particulate. And what PM 2.5 basically means is it is particles that are airborne that are 2.5 microns in diameter or smaller. And that includes things like bacteria, wildfire smoke, the coronavirus, which is about 0.1 microns in diameter when it's by itself, um, and, and different, different bacteria and viruses fall into that category. So this chart comes from the filter industry uh, that shows different MERV ratings and their particle removal efficiency at different particle sizes. And so the x-axis here goes from zero to 10 microns. And whether you have MERV, or MERV 8, MERV 10, or MERV 13 filter, all filters have a weakness in the 0.3 to 0.4 micron range. And that is related to physics. We've got some appendix items that you can read about that explains why this phenomenon takes place. But it, it intuitively, it makes sense that larger particle sizes should have higher particle efficiency removals for, for every filter, and they do. So you see as we get beyond one micron, all of the filters start to get above 50%. They start to do really well. But down here in this 0.3 to 0.4 range, which we talked about, which is where some dusts and viruses and wildfire smoke reside, all these filters have this weakness. So GPS has, has set up experimentation in a lab to demonstrate um, how ionization can improve filter performance. And basically, we follow a, an ASHRAE uh, 52 type testing methodology. We use a 10 by 10 chamber. We use six air changes per hour. And we have run um, particle testing using calibrated cigarettes. And the reason that we do that is because these calibrated cigarettes, we, we know exactly how many particles of each particle size are being introduced to the chamber, being mixed, and then being removed by a filter by itself, and then by a filter with the ionization running. And what we found is that a MERV 10 filter by itself does a pretty good job after about 40 minutes removing this calibrated cigarette smoke, but you can see very clearly demonstrated here that weakness in the filter between 0.25 and 0.4 microns in particle size. And so after 40 minutes, we're well under 20% removal efficiency in this size range. Meanwhile, we get up over 50% removal as we get closer to one micron with this MERV-10 filter. <clears throat> and that's over 40 minutes. We continue this experiment out, running the six changes an hour, out to 360 minutes, and you can still see this weakness in the curve at 0.35 microns, even after 360 minutes and all those ear changes. You start getting closer to one micron in size, <clears throat> and after this time, you, you, do, you do get very good particle removal at the larger particle sizes. So above one, you have very good performance with the filter. But down here where we, where we care about these particle sizes as it relates to viruses and pathogens and bacteria, molds, uh, and wildfire smoke, we still have this weakness. So when we, we clean the chamber with HEPA, um, HEPA cleaned air, get the chamber clean, and start the procedure over again, this time with a MERV-10 filter plus ionization, and you can see that after 10 minutes, we have really, really dramatically improved performance and by 40 minutes, we're up to almost 100%. We have flattened the curve, eliminated this weakness with the, um, with the ionization, helping the filter to perform better. And we've done this repeatedly in the lab and found that the curves hold true after multiple 
um, after multiple curves. And we see this in the field. So as a, as a field salesperson and engineer, it's very nice to see in the lab with where we can control all the variables, demonstrate repeatedly what we see uh, oftentimes in the field. And this is the kind of the, 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 the summary shot showing in blue a MERV 10 filter by itself after 40 minutes with four air changes compared to a MERV 10 filter plus ionization with the same, same protocol. So beyond the particle story, which in my view is the most important thing, if we can remove particulate from the air, that's a fantastic benefit to improving indoor air quality. The second benefit, which helped GPS expand uh, our, our business quite a bit through the pandemic, was the efficacy to certain viruses and uh, bacteria in the air. And we've done similar lab testing with a BSL-2 and BSL-3 type chambers. I think we were one of the first OEMs to actually get uh, access to live coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, in a lab setting to be able to test efficacy. And what you see in, in this schematic is an 8x8x20 eight by eight by chamber where a nebulizer port is used to introduce live virus. And we circulate the air, we run the ionization device, and we've tested this at multiple different ion densities, multiple uh, viral load concentrations, and we found very effective efficacy in percent net reduction of these live uh, viruses and bacteria. Um, and when we say percent net reduction, it's because there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that if someone walks into a space and coughs or sneezes, there's a natural decay that takes place with the virus that they expel. And so when we, when we do the testing, we are careful to only measure net reduction, which is how does the reduction in uh, active virus counts compare to a natural decay? And that's what these numbers represent. All this information is available through Buckley. They have access, you have access to our website. Um, so this is, this is really important um, consideration for schools, for hotels, for office buildings, all different property types as it relates to trying to help generate that sense of confidence to bring people back to the office. Finally, um, odor control. I've done several field studies uh, in different types of properties and when we talk about odor control, there's VOCs involved in that. There are so many different VOCs, and one of the things that we're involved in right now in the lab is testing against very specific VOCs so that we can publish that kind of data so the customers can understand which VOCs do we have uh, the ability to help reduce actively. I can tell you, though, that odors like trash, um, occupied spaces adjacent to loading docks, helipads and medical applications, there's been a long history of use with the GPS product line to, to mitigate odors. So this, this schematic shows a duct mounted application where the ions are being introduced into airflow and then being, um, being delivered to the space through the supplier diffusers. This is, a, um, this is a, an example of one of our auto cleaning um, devices. Our duct mounted products and our fan mounted products have this feature to where every day this, this, um, this wiper blade will actuate and rotate to remove any dust or lint that accumulates on the positive or negative uh, fiber bundles. And I mentioned that this technology is called needle point, but it's not a needle. These are actually thousands of carbon fiber bristles that actually emit the positive and the negative ions. What's really nice about this, and when we talk to maintenance people and, and, um, and property managers, they really like the fact that this technology can be installed, commissioned, and then there's no ongoing maintenance, there's no replacement parts. We, we feel like if this um, product is installed correctly, it'll last at least 10 years. We recommend not cycling it, since there's no ozone being generated. We, we recommend that it just be allowed to run and then when the air comes on, the airflow rolls over the, dev the device and delivers ions into either the coil or into the airspace. These are some installed photos. This is a single duct-mounted application. This one is on an evaporator coil. 
This is a fan mounted unit in the uh, bottom center that you see. And this is good for rooftop units, things like that, where you don't maybe you don't have access to the ductwork. When we've got um, uh, a larger airflow, we can put these in parallel with one another. Uh, and that's what this, this represents. These duct mounted devices, the one that you see here is rated for up to 4,800 CFM. In a, a VAV application, I'll typically derate that to maybe 2,500 CFM to account for VAV turndown. Um, but one of the things that I really like about this technology and that drew me to it when I was doing the vetting on behalf of, of my former employer was just how scalable it is. We can do a single conference room or a classroom or a hotel room, or we can scale up and do a 30,000 square foot ballroom or a 50,000 square foot common area. So it's, it's very scalable. Down here on the left side, you see again, evaporator uh, mounted applications with the iMod. You may have seen that before. Here's another photo of a fan mounted unit. Um, I like to talk about instrumentation because a lot of end users um, will ask the question during presentations, they'll say, how can we measure what the technology is doing? How do we know that it actually works? And that's a great question. Um, and the answer is there's a lot of different IAQ instrumentation out there. Unfortunately, it's not inexpensive and it requires a pretty significant investment. Um, GPS doesn't sell a suite of IAQ instrumentation, but I've done a lot of field work with third party applications. Senseware is one of the companies that I'm more familiar with. I've done a lot of field studies with them. They actually um, have an IAQ instrument that can measure uh, temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide, VOCs, different PM levels in addition to ions. So I've used this equipment quite a bit. It allows you to generate some really good data as it relates to the, the IAQ parameters in the space. They've got tremendous reporting, tremendous analytics, and this sounds like a commercial for Senseware, but it's not. I'm just, just giving you an example of the type of instrumentation that is out there for really monitoring IAQ performance. One of the things I also like to talk about with end users is they want to know, you know, where is the industry heading as it relates to IAQ? The pandemic has put such a focus on indoor air quality, outside air ventilation, and Ebtron will talk about that at the noon session. I recommend you attend that if you're not signed up. But um, what, what I see as the direction of, of the industry as it relates to building management and, and hopefully design will, will come along with this too, is that carbon dioxide is not the only measure of indoor air quality, but for over 20 years, the industry has really focused on it because it's a really good proxy for outside air ventilation and occupancy. You know that as occupancy increases, CO2 levels will rise, and you know that um, outside air Ventilation rates are typically designed based around occupancy, and we, we measure occupancy by CO2, and that's, that's fair, and, um, and a lot of buildings are doing that. And demand control ventilation is one of, the more, um, one of the more advanced control techniques that I've seen, at least in, in the properties that I've toured. A lot of them don't even have that, but carbon dioxide is, is very good to measure ventilation effectiveness and occupancy. However, if you're in an area of the country that is experiencing high levels of pollen or wildfire smoke is drifting across your city, you might have very good carbon dioxide levels, but your air quality may not be good at all just because of the airborne particulate that's being introduced to the building through the outside air. So in my opinion, and what I'm seeing the more advanced uh, customers do and engineers too, is adding PM sensing to the carbon dioxide sensing. And that, that gives you the additional parameter of airborne particulate that you can monitor and quantify. And if you add this to your BAS, or if you use a third party web application like Senseware or Kytera, one of the others that are out there, you can give the building operators a very good um, set of data that they can trend, they can, they can look for problems, they can identify if outside air maybe has failed. And to me, this is a good next step in the evolution of the industry is adding PM, say 2.5 is a commonly used metric to your CO2 monitoring. 
Um, now you can go further if, if an end user or client's budget can tolerate it, you can monitor VOCs, you can monitor a, a number of specific things. But in my experience, volatile organic compounds are very volatile. Building finishes these days tend to be low VOC, no VOC. So if you're having a, a space painted or if you're getting new carpet or if you're bringing new furniture into a building, if a building engineer is, is savvy, he can turn up the outside air ventilation during projects like that and the half-life of those VOCs that are off-gassed from paint, carpet, adhesives, furniture, it typically, uh, it typically dies off very, very quickly. And ongoing monitoring of VOCs, in, in my opinion, is probably uh, a, something that would be really nice to have, but not essential. I think that, that monitoring particulate is much more valuable in terms of, of understanding steady state operation of a building. I mentioned that we that our technology scales. This is a snapshot of the type of applications that we're in, um, from agriculture, airports, casinos, hotels, schools, office buildings. It's just really across the board with over 200,000 installations. These are an example of some of our commercial real estate clients. Uh, we were in a number of different retailers. We've got a number of hospitality clients. Uh, K through 12 has been a very big vertical market for us, so has higher education, and of course healthcare um, rounds it out. So uh, I'd like to finish the, the kind of the academic part of the conversation by saying we understand that the pandemic is further and further in the rearview mirror, but hopefully the focus on indoor air quality is going to stay with our industry. Um, you know. I hear a lot of uh, a lot of advocates for indoor air quality monitoring and instrumentation will say, you know, the government very carefully regulates the water that we drink from the municipalities. And so when you go and get your your water bottle filled at a water fountain or, or a break room sink, you have a good degree of, of confidence in most places of the country that that water complies with certain standards. The same is not true with the air in a, in, a, uh, in a building. It's really up to the building operator and manager to be wise about what they're doing and to operate in a, a safe and healthy way. So hopefully IAQ is, is, is uh, the focus on that is here to stay. We know that we have cold and flu seasons every year. Um, asthma and allergies and pollen are a year round concern in a lot of the country. And of course, wildfire smoke has affected a lot of properties and not just in the western part of the country. I'd like to, um, uh, to show you some, some information about that in a minute. But the last thing I would mention is that there have been a lot of studies that, that quantify that poor indoor air quality affects productivity. The military has done testing on CO2 levels. And um, you know th this kind of, of research is often subjective it's hard to measure productivity but but people have done studies with cognitive ability and re relative to different IAQ parameters and it just makes sense that when you have good indoor air quality people are going to be more more healthy more productive and more happy so we talked about wildfire smoke i'd like to um, show you some data from a case study that i did in an office building out in denver last year and what we did was we used the sensor equipment that I mentioned. We put it in the building in a in a common area, and we monitored indoor air quality parameters for several weeks before we turned on the GPS devices before ionization was running. And we just happened to capture a wildfire that was taking place right near the building, and it caused. We were monitoring indoor air and outdoor air with sensor equipment. And the black trend line that you see here is outdoor PM 2.5. We had this device up on the roof. And the EPA says that for PM 2.5, if you exceed 12 micrograms per cubic meter, then you're no longer considered in the healthy uh, level. And if you get to 55, it really becomes pretty, pretty seriously unhealthy. And what we captured in the on the building. Uh, on the building data was that we had an outside air excursion that lasted for several hours on Thursday, December 30th. And this black trend line shows that 
We went above 12 for several hours. We exceeded 55 for a brief amount of time. And when I pulled this data, I didn't know what had happened, but I asked our territory manager out in Denver if he knew what happened on December 30th. And he said, oh yeah, we had a, a really nasty fire. Um, and when I went back to the media reports from the Denver Post, sure enough, on December 30th, in Broomfield, Colorado, the police were evacuating residents that are, and this is this is within a couple miles of the building. And so I guess we kind of got lucky that we just happened to capture this event. And what we were able to show the owner was, here is what was taking place inside the building. I've got it charted on the same chart up here, but you really can't see it because of the y-axis scaling. So I put it down here with the same time window and here's what we measured inside the building during this multi-hour wildfire event. And the building engineer confirmed he did not turn off outside air. The building continued to run as normal. Building was lightly occupied. And what you see here is that this building had MERV 13 filters and the inside air quality, the PM 2.5 trend stayed below about three micrograms per cubic meter. Okay, so I want you to remember that. This is what happened inside when wildfire smoke was being introduced into the building with MERV 13 filters. And again, EPA says anything below 12 is considered healthy. So this, this showed my building owner, my client, that the MERV 13 filters did a good job mitigating this wildfire smoke and the, the particles that were being introduced into the building. Well, we turned on the GPS devices on January 18th, okay? On January 21st, and then on February 23rd and 25th, we again had outside air excursions where our PM 2.5 exceeded 12. We didn't quite hit 55 on the January 21st incident, but we did exceed 55 on February 23rd and February 25th. Not real sure what exactly happened outside that caused this, but I'll tell you that outdoor air quality events are very local and you can have, you can have very good data at public monitoring stations just five miles away from an event like this. So what we showed though, that was, that was after the devices had been turned on for three days in this case, and then for a couple of weeks on the later events, look at the difference with indoor air quality, the indoor PM 2.5 curve, whereas here, it stayed below three. During this event, it stayed below two. And during these two events, the indoor PM 2.5 stayed below one microgram per cubic meter. And so this was a really impressive before and after data collection exercise that is very hard to obtain because when you've got an office building that is not fully occupied, that is doing a lot of ventilation, it's, it's sometimes hard to see the before and the after, but this was a really nice case study that we were able to capture at this office building in Denver. The, the, uh, the, the engineering staff with this uh, ownership group was really pleased to see this, and it resulted in, um, in some additional proposals that we, that we generated for them. Um, the other thing that I wanted to share is that Wildfire smoke, a lot of people think, well, if you're not in California or if you're not in Nevada, your buildings probably aren't going to be impacted by wildfire smoke. That's not actually the case because last August, you may remember, actually, sorry, two Augusts ago, it was August of 21, out west there were over 100 wildfires burning in California. These were photographed from Denver, which is where my, my office building was, where I just showed you that case study from. And I talked to um, my customer about this and the, the state of Colorado has a number of outside air publicly available stations. And on August 7th, they showed an air quality index um, range. It was very unhealthy because of PM 2.5. They had a concentration of over 55 micrograms per cubic meter. This is what the map of the United States looked like. If you, if you go to the airnow.gov, this is a government website that aggregates data from all the different states, all the different publicly available IAQ uh, data, or sorry, air quality, not indoor air quality, but outside air quality data. 
And this is what the map looked like on August 7 with over 100 wildfires burning. This airborne particulate drifted across the country over a number of days. And I live in the Carolinas and I remember the week after this, we had some very red sunsets in the North Carolina mountains because of this soot and particulate that drifted all the way to the East Coast. Um, and, you know, it's, it's bad enough to think about wildfire smoke as it relates to the airborne um, particulate related to the burning of forests and, and, and shrubbery. But think about when homes get consumed or when cars get in the path of these wildfires. Think about all the, the VOCs and the rubber and, and plastics and all the other things that get burned and they get aerosolized into the air and end up drifting across the country and they end up in, um, they end up in our buildings. And if you have that additional test data, not just CO2, but if you add particulate to what you're measuring, that's something that can be triggered to a building engineer to say, hey, something's going on. Your PM 2.5 level has risen beyond your normal trend. Maybe you should turn off your outside air. Maybe there's an event taking place that you should basically um, isolate the building for a little while until whatever's happening is removed. So just something to, to be aware of and think about. Another case study I'd like to share is from a hotel that we did in um, Charleston, South Carolina, where you can imagine um, humidity uh, concerns and challenges are really dramatic. This was a temperature and humidity trend from a single guest room. And you can see here, the humidity was above 70% for most of this eight day study. Now, as a result of this excess humidity, there were musty odors in, in the room, and we were this was an odor control application, but it also turned into a particle control application with the data that, uh, that I collected over the eight days. This room was occupied for the full, full week except for one night, and I showed the temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide as our typical IAQ parameters that we look at. Just incidentally, this, um, this hotel had a very serious negative pressurization problem. It did not have appropriate makeup air, uh, outside air being conditioned. It had restroom exhaust throughout the property that was causing a net negative pressure. And it was, it was just pulling in lots of unconditioned air and humidity into the building. I've, I've helped them with that. And, and um, that's a, a project that is queued up to actually fix that. But as a result, you can imagine when, if you've been in a hotel that's got humidity control problems, you know that there are typically odors associated with that, and they, they definitely had that. So what we showed them was the ion trend for the whole eight days. It, it bounced around a bit on the beginning, and then it went down. We also tracked VOCs for the week, and you can see that in the first half of the week, VOC counts were very low. The second half of the week, they got higher that's probably related to the occupancy in the room because VOCs will be captured by um, the introduction of things like perfumes, hairsprays, alcohol, food, lots of different things will generate VOCs in, a, in an occupied space. So the PM 2.5 trend looks like this. When I looked at it uh, on a macro level over the eight days, I really didn't see anything and I'll, I'll show you why that is. But I broke it down day by day to make it easier to see. And then I, I, I bolded the five microgram per cubic meter line for this, uh, for this hotel room. And you can see that on the first day, the GPS ionization device was turned on on May 23rd. On the first day, PM 2.5 hovered around five micrograms per cubic meter. You can see a little bit of a trend down on the first day. On the second day, we had a dip below the five line, again, five micrograms per cubic meter, which is low, but it is not as low as what I typically see in buildings that have uh, MRF 13 filtration. This hotel room had a PTAC, and if you're familiar with the filters on PTACs, they're not very good. But you can see on day two, we were a little bit below the line of five, and then a little bit above the line. By the end of the third day, we trended below five micrograms per cubic meter, pretty consistently by the second half of the day. And then when we got to day four, we were well below the five line all day, okay? 
Then on the fifth day, we had a big spike. And when I reviewed this data with the general manager of the hotel, he surmised that this would be when the cleaning staff went in. And this, this spike in PM 2.5 is most likely related to vacuuming and dusting, generating stuff in the air. And we saw a very brief time when the PM 2.5 spiked up to 96 micrograms per cubic meter. Again, not surprising compared, you know, when you consider cleaning, housekeeping, going in the room. And so with that spike, you really can't see very well the rest of this curve. So I broke the day in two. And on the next page, I'm going to show you what, what the curve looked like up to the spike and then after the spike had settled out. And that's what you see here. So from midnight to about 8.30 in the morning, you can see we were well below even the 2.5 micrograms per cubic meter line. And then from 10 a.m. after the spike went away to midnight, very consistently below the 5 line and even below the 2.5 line. Same story on day six. We had a spike at 3.30. General manager thought that housekeeping went in there about that time. So when we get rid of the spike and we look at the curve before and after, we see that from midnight to 3 p.m., really impressive reduction in PM 2.5, well below two for the entire stretch of this uh, time frame. And then again, from 4.30 to midnight, well below five. So that's day six. Day seven, continued to look very, very good. Day eight also looked very good. So you consider the, the duration of this experiment from what, where we started, where we were hovering around five, and five is not terrible, but it is not as good as what I typically see in buildings that have better air filters. But by the end of the week, really impressive reduction. And again, this is a hotel room that was occupied for the whole week except one night. This was very uh, impressive to the property owner, the head of engineering. The other thing that I'll say about this pilot project, which started as an odor control, I, I asked the building engineer and the general manager, don't go in this room for about a week. Don't go in there every day to sniff it. Give it a week and see what you think. And by the eighth day, the general manager went in there and reported that the, those musty odors had been neutralized. And the product that we used on this application was our new compact device. And I will show you that now. Uh, this device is about the size of a deck of cards. It's got the auto clean feature technology to where it will, it will, it will dust the carbon fiber brushes on its own. This device runs on 24 volts. This is our first product made in the United States. We introduced it at the AHR show in the first quarter of this year in Las Vegas. Um, the sales, Salesforce got our hands on them in the second quarter, and I've done a couple of pilot projects with them. This, this one hotel that we did in May was, was the first one that I did. Um, this device is small enough that it fits right behind the discharge grill of the PTAC. Um, so very unobtrusive. The a guest can't see it, and it worked really, really well. Oh, I'll also mention, um, like most OEMs, we are diversifying our supply chain. This is our first product to be made in the United States, and we're really pleased about that. Um, we also are very uh, pleased to, to say Buckley has access to our entire product line with very short lead times. We have not been disrupted like a lot of the OEMs have. So if you were to order a thousand devices today, Buckley could place that order and GPS could fulfill it within probably, probably seven to 10 days, calendar days. Um, we've got uh, a duct mounted device, which we see here. This can be mounted indoors or outdoors. It's got the auto cleaning technology. This device can run on 24 to 208 volts. It's rated up to 4,800 CFM. Like I said, for a VAV application, I'll typically drop the rating on this to account for the VAV turndown. I have been very successful deploying this device in duct mounted applications around the country. This is a new duct mounted device that we introduced this year. It's rated to only 2400 CFM, about half the capacity of the other device, but it's got a lower price point. And where this device is made to be installed in medium pressure loops, this device is made to be installed downstream of each zone. So imagine putting one of these 
downstream of each VAV or PIU box to get the ion generation closer to the diffusers and get higher ion counts into the space. This is a flexible saddle that we created to accommodate this device. If you are mounting this device into a rectangular duct, we've got a plastic bracket that this will attach to. It's a very simple installation. We wanted something to be able to adapt to round ducts of different sizes. <clears throat> and so if you've got a very large diameter duct that's round, you can use this with very little flex in it. This will flex all the way down to six inch in diameter. So that, that was very popular at the AHR show with the mechanical contractors, just making the installation even easier. This device I showed you in, in some of the install photos, this can be mounted on the inlet of a fan venturi. This can go on rooftop units, any sort of air handler where you have room. And this is our iMod. This is an evaporator coil mounted product. We use this a lot for odor control applications, for keeping coils clean. This can be scaled up based on the width and height of the coil. And uh, Buckley can help you with those kind of sizing applications and so can, um, and so can we. Mentioned this, this compact device. We've got a transformer. Because this compact device is um, rated for only 24 volts, whereas all of our other products can go 24 to 240, we, we came up with a transformer that will work from 110 to 277 volts. Of course, you can use any transformer to power this guy at 24 volts, but we came up with this for a turnkey solution. We've got a lot of appendix information about indoor air quality, about um, quantifying particulate and different particle sizes. This is all publicly available information, but Buckley can send you our particulate packet if you'd like more information. They can also send you our most recent marketing slides. Um, and again, if you'd like to continue this conversation, we would love to, to work with you. If you have specific questions, um, I'll open up that now. Uh, right before I do that, though, I do want to share we've got um, a number of different signage options for the end user that wants to message this or communicate uh, with their occupants or with their, uh, with their staff. A number of different things that can be used. We can use QR codes. They can be um, jointly branded. This can point to an end user's wellness page or the GPS website. We also created one that, that can be made into a window sticker. We also have a media kit that we will share with end users that give them some frequently asked questions, different um, summary bullet points, talking points for what the technology does, who we are as a company, what it doesn't do, et cetera. And we'd like to provide that to, to end users. So with that, we've got a few minutes left for Q&A. If anybody um, has any, feel free to, to um, enter those and um, we can talk about them. If you want to have an ongoing conversation, please get in touch with, with Sean and the Buckley team. We would love to, to continue the discussion, have some additional uh, time with you. But thank you very much for joining us today. I really appreciate it.